Hi, my name is Leslie Solomon. It is with great pleasure that I present my video on sweater finishing techniques for hand and machine knitters. With all the work, money, and time you put into your knitting, you certainly wouldn't want to ruin your efforts with inadequate information on how to finally put it all together. When you know exactly how to approach blocking, a simple side seam, or the magic of an invisible shoulder seam, you will look forward to the finishing of the knitted pieces you so carefully created. You will end with a finished product that is flawless and professional looking on the inside as well as the outside. Most of the easy to learn finishing techniques can be used by all knitters, but a few might only apply to machine knitters. Hand knitters might enjoy seeing the knitting machine in action. Many knitting book authors have attempted to explain a variety of finishing methods, but one may find it difficult to follow written instructions or to decide what methods are best. Since the picture is worth a thousand words, it's always easier to learn a skill by seeing it actually than by reading about it. The techniques I have chosen for many methods strive for neatness and the most invisibility. Through this video, it will be as if I am sitting there with you and my hands will be your hands. Each technique demonstrated on the various samples that I have prepared will be numbered so that you may quickly and easily find a particular section when needed with your visual fast forward on your VCR. The following list of techniques will be demonstrated. Blocking with blocking wires, the invisible shoulder seam, tips for improving neck bands, invisible side seams, seaming the afghan, installation of the set-in and drop shoulder sleeve, binding off one by one ribbing by hand for machine knitters, graphing ribbing at the shoulders for boat neck sweaters, the perfect zipper installation, see how to improve the edges of bands, collars, and tabs, how to make your own puffed shoulder pads, and how to install them, how to shorten or lengthen knits, the commercial neckband for machine knitters, weaving in ends to avoid knots, and the final steaming. As you will be sewing your sweater together, you will want to take the time to do the very best job that you possibly can. If something does not seem to be going right, remove your stitches and try it again. Maybe a short break will make some of the frustration disappear as it might give you the time to think about how you can do it again. Sometimes only five minutes of removing stitches and restitching cures the whole problem, and a don't look too close attitude is replaced with a lifetime of pride. The mistake that frustrates you, causing you to give in to imperfection, you know, the one that no one will notice, will surely continue to haunt you and possibly make the sweater unwearable. When you are sewing this potentially magnificent creation together, this is the easiest time to take just a few minutes to backtrack and do it again to make a sweater you will be proud to show that ever critical relative, your friend, the perfectionist knitter, or the jewelry at the craft fair. Now let's begin with blocking. You might think of blocking as something that doesn't apply to you or something only for the dry cleaners to perform. When you find out how easy and beneficial blocking can be and how it can make you look like a very talented knitter, you wouldn't finish a sweater without doing it. Blocking should be done before your sweater is sewn together and it will improve the final shape and dimensions of your knitted pieces. It will also uncurl and improve the look of the knitted fabric. Look at these two examples of a cable design. Before blocking, this cable sample shrinks in and is very elastic, like ribbing. This uses many more stitches per inch. When blocked, the same amount of stitches shows more of the lights and shadows, which is the beauty of this kind of knitting. You might think of blocking your tension swatch first, then measuring it, as blocking will change the amount of stitches and rows per inch. Look at this sleeve. It curls and the shape is uncertain. After blocking, the shape has been established. It is now ready to be sewn. Look at this lace and two color fair all design. It looks wrinkled and sloppy. After blocking, the knitting looks more even. The stitch design is more defined. The feel of the fabric that the yarn has created has softened and the final sweater will look more expertly done. It is not the objective of blocking to flatten the beauty of textured knitting, 
It is necessary to form, uncurl, and smooth. The results will be a more masterful looking garment. Various fibers are of course to be treated differently. Wool, rayon, cotton, and silk can be gently steamed using moderation. However, because of their low melting point, most man-made fibers, such as acrylic, metallic, nylon, and polyester, can be greatly damaged when exposed to too much heat. One should use great caution. Never apply an iron directly to the surface of your knitting. Simply hover a few inches above the wrong side. And remember, never steam authentic Angora. Space, blocking wires, a good steam iron, and strong pins are all the tools you will need to block. Your space can be a large plywood or styrofoam board covered and stapled with a few wool blankets and a cotton cloth. A towel covering an excess piece of carpet can do the trick. The wires are the newest tool to knitting since the knitting machine. They replace the multitudes of pins normally associated with blocking. Made of stainless steel to avoid rusting, they can be purchased through your local yarn shop or by, by mail order. An address will be given at the end of this segment. Here's how it is done. The point of the wires are inserted every half an inch or so into a single strand of yarn along the edge of the knitted piece. This eliminates the use of hundreds of pins scalloping the edge of your knitting. When all edges are wired, remarkable control is gained. Now I'm going to do the other side. I'm simply uncurling the edge of the knitted piece and inserting the wire into a single strand. It doesn't have to be perfect every half an inch or so. Curves such as necks, armholes, and sleeve caps need the thin wires that can be molded to any shape. Now I'm going to wire the head of this sleeve. Now that all my edges are wired, I'm going to pin one wired side onto the blocking surface, wrong side up. I'm only going to need about three pins. If I follow my schematic, this should be about 12 inches. Now I'm going to pin the other wired side, smoothing it to the measurement needed. Notice that the ribbing has not been wired. This area should not be steamed or some elasticity will be lost.
Now I'm ready to steam my sweater. This is acrylic, so I'm simply hovering above the knitted fabric. For machine knitters, if you have traced from your paper pattern to a charting device, you can again use the paper pattern as a blocking guide. Place the pattern on the blocking area first, then your garment piece directly on top of the pattern, pinning the edge of the piece along the lines of the paper pattern. Steam with a good steam iron. With caution and plenty steam, wet towels may not be necessary, but a dry cloth could provide some protection. Allow the knitting not only to cool, but to dry for at least 24 hours before removing the pins and wires for finishing. Now let's talk about when you're making a cotton sweater. You might try blocking the cotton swatch by wetting it and drying it. These two knitted samples show how cotton knitting changes after just being wetted and air dried. Each sample is the same amount of stitches and rows, but after washing there's a substantial difference in size, causing more stitches per inch. Imagine if you made your sweater based on the stitch and row information in this swatch before washing. After washing, your finished sweater might shrink this much. What if the colors bleed? Wouldn't you want to know about this first before you try washing your finished sweater? If the cotton sweater is to be hand or machine washed, simply make a swatch, wet it and dry it the way you intend your finished sweater to be washed and dried. After drying it, it may be measured to determine how many stitches and rows you have to the inch. Now you are ready to begin sewing your perfectly shaped pieces together. Neat seams are great, but when you can make a seam disappear like this shoulder seam, that's really outstanding. This technique is called grafting, or the Kitchener stitch, and it is used for sewing unbound off stitches together for shoulder seams. Here's how it's done for hand knitters. Do not bind off at the shoulders. Leave the stitches on the needles and write down the following. Knit off, purl on, purl off, knit on. You want to start from the outside, and you want to work toward the neck. Hold the two needles together, having the needle points facing the right. Take the threaded large-eyed needle and insert the point into the first stitch as if the sewing needle is a knitting needle and you are about to knit. I'm going to knit, pretend to knit, and take it off the needle. Then I'm going to pretend to purl, but keep it on. Hence, knit off, purl on. Pull just tight enough so the string looks like the rest of the knitting. Now you go to the back needle, and you want to put the needle into the stitch as if to purl, and this comes off, and now you want to enter the needle into the stitch as if to knit, and this stays on. Now you're going to pull, and you want to pull just tight enough so it looks like the rest of the knitting. Again, put your needle in the stitch as if to knit, take it off, put your needle in the, in the stitch as if to purl, but leave it on. See how I'm pulling just tight enough. Go to the back needle, purl, off, enter into the stitch as if to knit, but keep it on. Knit off, purl, on. And I'm pulling just tight enough so what I'm doing is looking like the rest of the knitting. Purl off, knit on. Go to the front, knit off, purl on, purl off, knit, and keep it on. You want to continue across all the way to the end 
Remember not to pull tight because you are adding another row of knitting and you want what you're adding to look just like the rest of the knitting. Knit off, purl on. Nearing the end, purl off, knit on. And you have that half an inch or well, half a stitch on either side. You might want to go back and tighten up some of your stitches to make it look more even. Here's another method for doing the Kitchener stitch. This could be used for hand and machine knitters. This is another way of holding stitches. It requires knitting your shoulder stitches on an inch or two of extra knitting of a different color called waist knitting. Waist knitting is only holding stitches and then it will be unraveled away when the grafting is complete. Notice how the garment stitches, and that's a peach color, go into the waist knitting which is a pink. See what is a stitch and what is half of one stitch and half of another stitch. Here are two yarns. These two yarns make up a whole stitch. It also resembles a circle. These two yarns happen to be half of one stitch and half of another stitch. In this stitch we will be picking up two yarns but you want to make sure it is half of one stitch and half of another stitch. Here are two separate circles here, or two separate stitches. We will be picking up half of one and half of the other. And here's how it's done. I'm threading my needle, and the yarn is coming out of one side. I'm going to hold my two pieces together, curling the waist yarn underneath. To begin, if my yarn's coming out of one side, I'm going to go to the opposite side, take the needle and put it underneath the first stitch to the top. Now I'm going to go find that first stitch on the opposite side. And here it is. It resembles a circle. I'll make it look real big. And I'm going to take half of this first circle and half of the next and pull. Now again, I'm going to go to the opposite side go back to where the yarn was before. I'm going to get half of that first stitch, half of the second stitch. Pull only so the, the uh, yarn resembles the knitting. Again, go back into the circle I was in once before. This circle or stitch is right here. I'm going to take half of this stitch, half of the next stitch. Go back to the same place I was in once before and I can tell where that is. You can tell that yarn's coming out of that first stitch. Pick half of this stitch, half of the next stitch. I'm always looking for two yarns. It's never a whole stitch. If I did this, I'd be making a mistake, and when I take the waist yarn out, all the stitches would just fall apart. If that would happen, I would just put the stitches back on waist yarn and try it again. Instead, I'm looking for half of one stitch, half of the next. Pull just so the knitting looks like the rest of the, or the string looks like the rest of the knitting. Half of one stitch, half of the next. It also helps when you can look at these two yarns and you can see they come to a point. These two come to a point, but these two are wide apart. Go for the ones that come to a point. half and half. And remember that a stitch looks like a circle going into the waist yarn. 
I can always look for that pink or that peach circle going into the waist yarn. That's a stitch. And here's the one I was in once before. When you've done it correctly, you will end with a half a stitch on one side and a half a stitch on the other. If you don't end with that, with that half a stitch on one side and half on the other, there's a good possibility that somewhere along the line you've done this. You've picked up a whole stitch and gone on. And that's when, when you take the waist yarn out, all your stitches will just fall apart. Okay, now I'm nearing the end of this row. And here's where I will have the last half. And that's what you should look for. If you have that last half, you've probably done it right. Here it is. Now we're going to unravel the waist yarn to see what we've done. And that's how waist yarn got its name. It's knitting that is going to be spaghetti in your trash can. When knitting the neck edge of a round neck style sweater, it is preferable to hold the back and the center front of this neck stitches on stitch holders for hand knitters or waist yarn for machine knitters, and not to bind them off. When the front and the back neck edges are bound off, there's a chance that the bind off might be done tightly, causing not only a reduced neck size, but a lack of elasticity. There's nothing more disappointing than a beautiful sweater that doesn't fit over your head. When choosing where to pick up and knit around the neck edge, much of the guesswork is eliminated as each open stitch becomes part of the stitches that would be picked up for the neck ribbing. The finished areas, where there were some decreasing, are the only areas where you have to create new stitches. Instructions may tell you how many stitches to pick up around the neck, but the amount of stitches they suggest may be difficult to achieve. Try to pick up every space without picking up two stitches in one hole. By choosing the correct needle size and relying on the shrinking end of the ribbing, there is little chance that there will be too many stitches picked up. For machine knitters, let me show you how to pick up the stitches around the neck edge. Now let's talk about how a machine knitter would pick up the neck around a round neck edge. First, you need to cover your ribber because we're going to be using the, um, we're going to be putting the sweater right on top of the ribber as we hang the edge on the needles. First, you're going to bring an approximate amount of needles all the way out to E position. We've sewn one shoulder together, and now this entire neck edge is still a straight line when we open it up, and I'm going to take this edge and place it onto these needles. Before I do that, I want to find the center of the entire neck edge, not the center front, but just the, the center of this entire length. It's about here, with the wrong side facing me in my single prong transfer tool. I'm going to insert the single prong into a whole stitch of the edge. Now this is my center. I'm going to center it on the machine. Now I'm going to go to the next space. Put my transfer tool in it and hang it right onto that hook. The next space. I'm going to move along the edge of the neck, rehanging this area that I did my decreasing onto the needles. Soon I'm going to come to where I have waist yarn or open stitches. The space between the waist yarn and the open stitches, you might see what resembles a ladder. I don't want you to pick that up. Just go right to the waist yarn. I think I'm going to hang one more on this side. Now I'm going to go right to the waist yarn. The waist yarn areas are very easy to pick up because there's nothing to, to choose from. You're simply going to take the stitches held on waist yarn and you're going to put them right up onto the hooks of the needles. You can even try using two prongs to save some time. I'm 
I'm just going to stop at the last stitch that's held on waist yarn because after that is my shoulder area and that I will Kitchener stitch together. So I don't need these needles, so I'm going to push them back to A position. Now I'm ready to hang the other side. Placing my transfer tool one stitch in or two yarns. I don't want to pick up a single strand. I want to pick up a double strand. Here's that area between the decreased edge and the waist yarn. Looks like a ladder. Don't pick up that. Go right into the waist yarn stitches. Notice how the waist yarn is being curled behind the knitting. Again, I'm going to save time by picking up two stitches at once. Sometimes this works. Sometimes it causes more problems. Go back to the single prong. Here's the rest of my edge. I'll need more needles. I'm not looking for this ladder area, not picking that up. Sometimes I take a single stitch in transition, and now I'm picking up doubled stitches again. Picking and choosing where to insert the transfer tool into the edge. I'm actually taking every available space. I don't want to put two stitches in one hole like that. So be careful of that. When I'm nearing the end of rehanging this entire neck edge, I want to look to see how many stitches I've used up on this side. Looks like I have 33. That's an odd number. On this side, I hear 35, 36, 37, and I have a little bit of space left. I want to have a total amount of needles that are odd. So I can start off with a knit stitch on this side and end with a knit stitch on that side. That will give me a nice seam to, to uh, have on the edge. It'll, I can make the seam disappear when I sew up that little neck seam. So if I have 37 on this side, I want to add at least two more and I have the space for that. On this edge, what happens, which happens to be the front of the neck, here's the back of the neck to the shoulder, and here's the front. I can add or subtract so I can make the entire amount of needles an odd amount. Because I'm picking up the entire circumference of the neck, and later I will sew the neck seam together, I want to add one needle, one extra needle, which will be the uh, needle that will make a seam. Okay, now the sweater's between the knitter and the ribber. Now that my entire neck edge is hung onto the machine, this is equivalent to where hand knitting directions tell you to pick up, but now I need to turn all these stitches, especially this edge, into whole stitches. These are stitches here, but this edge is not stitches. I need to knit one row across, turning everything into stitches. So I'm going to take the yarn, thread it. It's okay to use the ribber arm when your needles are all the way out in E position. And my tension should be about two to three numbers less than the tension that I made the entire sweater on. So if I made this on setting nine, I can come across on setting seven. I'm going to remove the ribber covers. Make sure all the strings are off the ribber. And now we're going from stockinette stitch into ribbing. I have a little piece of waist yarn that's knitted in there. I'll get that out later. Um, I'm going to use my ribber weights. I need to use ribber weights. What I'm going to do is use these hanger weights. Now these hanger weights will hold the ribber weights. And I'm going to put weight evenly distributed across the entire width. Because when you use the ribber arm, the stitch has to be pulled off the hook of the needle. So you have to have weight when you do ribbing. I'm putting the ribber weights into the little holes. And now I'm going to bring the ribber up to the knitter. I need to transfer every other stitch to the knitter. The first stitch is going to be a knit stitch. Second stitch goes down to the ribber. So every other needle will be a ribber needle. And 
when I do this, I'm just grabbing the hook, pulling straight out, pushing straight in, and finding the opposite river needle. Okay. Now I'm going to adjust my row counter because if I have approximately seven rows to the inch, I want to make two inches. So I'll be making 14 rows. I'm adjusting my ribbing tension. The ribbing might have been made on setting one, but I like to make the ribbing of the neck a little bit looser. So I'm going to make it on setting two. I think that'll be nice. It won't shrink in too much. Fourteen rows. Now I'm going to transfer all stitches back to the knitter so I can bind off. This just means grabbing all the river stitches, transferring them back to the empty knitter needles. need to lower the river, remove my river weights, and I wanted a one inch neck ribbing, but I made two inches. I'm going to take, when I finish the ribbing, I'm going to fold this down, so it will be one inch, but it's going to be folded down and then slip stitched. So since it's folded down, I don't really have to worry about what the bind off is going to look like. It's going to be, it's, it's more important that the bind off be elastic than beautiful. There are ways to bind off in rib on a knitting machine, which we'll learn later. But here's a way to bind off so it, this is maybe not aesthetically beautiful, but it's very functional. You transfer one stitch to the next, and I'm going to take the butt of the needle and push up so the two stitches go behind the latch, yarn over in the hook, and pull back. Now I've put a weight right underneath where I'm working. I need for that loop to be double the size of these loops. But I'm going to do this again. Transfer one stitch to the next, push up, yarn over in the hook, and pull back. Make the loop large. You don't want to make it sloppy, but you want to make it large so you know that neck ribbing will not be too tight because you bound off too tight. The larger that loop is, the looser your bind off is going to be. And when that ribbing is going over your head, it will be comfortable. Just by transferring one stitch to the next, push up, yarn over in the hook. You don't want to yarn over behind the hook because when you pull back everything will fall off. Yarn over in the hook and then pull back. You might have to move the river weight up a little bit. It's because the river allows you to, I mean the um, claw weight. The claw weight helps you keep that loop whatever size you want. See how this stitch is double the size of this stitch? Continue binding off all the way across. As I bind off, as I transfer one stitch to the next, notice how I'm holding the ribbing as I transfer. Should I lose that stitch on my transfer tool, at least I'm holding it and it's not going to uncontrollably unravel. Remembering that this is a functional bind off. It's not binding off in pattern, but this will allow the ribbing to stretch to the maximum. And that's what's important. You won't see this edge when you turn it under and make a slip stitch or hem the neck. Last stitch. Transfer, push up, yarn over, Pull back, and there's your loop that you can, you can now cut this string. Bring the sweater up. I'm going to 
bring my end through the loop so it secures the bind off. And there's the neck ribbing around the round neck edge. Now I can remove the waist yarn. This is the best part. Waist yarn for the back. See how the waist yarn was just holding stitches open? And with this band, we're going to fold it under. This edge is not attractive. But when it's folded under, it doesn't matter. We won't see it. And now the next thing we'll have to do is to Kitchener stitch this shoulder together. And sew this seam and slip stitch the neck edge down. Now we're going to sew the other shoulder together just like we did before. Remember that I'm taking yarn out of one side, going to the opposite side, and I'm starting by putting my needle from underside to the top into the first circle or the first stitch. Go back into that first stitch on the other side, and I'm gra grabbing half of one stitch and half of the next. Always those two yarns, but half of one stitch and half of another. I'm back on the other side again. I can see I was coming out of this first stitch, go back into that same stitch again, so I catch this half and the next half. This is what I showed you before, when you should look for the two yarns that come to a point. Half of this stitch, half of the next stitch. Remembering not to pull too tight. So the sweater is coming along. We have the back and the front done, and we've sewn one shoulder together. Then we've picked up around the neck edge. And now we're completing the other shoulder. Now that the ribbing is completed. It was fun to rip out the waist yarn to see that we have a finished neck edge. Now this shoulder will go, well, as soon as I finish the shoulder, it's going to go right into the seam of the neck. And then we're going to be learning how to seam ribbing together called the mattress stitch. The sweater's turned inside out. And now I'm just going to pin it in a couple places just to make sure it's not crooked. Make sure it's lined up. This kit, this waist yarn I can remove. It's in the way now. See, there's the seam. Okay, I'm going to take the yarn. I always leave lots of strings. You never know when you need a sewing thread. In this slip stitch, very similar to hand, for, for hand sewing, where you just grab part of the body of the sweater and a part of the neck, and you just make a pleasant little stitching around the neck edge. Try to be consistent. This is the part that will not show, but you do want to make sure you're not pulling too tight so when the sweater's pulled around over the head, there's enough give. You might want to be consistent where you try to grab every knit stitch. This is a knit stitch and that's a knit stitch, so I'm looking for every knit stitch. When you will need to sew your side and sleeve seams, you will want to use the mattress stitch. 
No pins are necessary, but it is important to have the same amount of rows on each side. Your seams will match and be almost invisible, but the trick is in the starting. I'm going to thread my yarn that I've left on my cast on. And what we're trying to create is a very invisible seam where you almost don't seem, see a break in the seam at all. It'd be, it would be as if the ribbing is continuous. Sometimes on sweaters you see after they've been sewn together they sort of have a little dip there. I want to try to avoid that. So my yarn is coming out of one side. I'm going to go from underneath. I'm going to find two yarns down on the bottom. And I'm coming up through the purl stitch on the right side. My end stitch is a knit stitch. This next stitch is a purl stitch. My needle comes two stitches up and into the purl stitch. And I'm going to pull. Then I'm going to go back on the other side. Coming up from the bottom, I want to come right into that purl stitch from underside, from underneath. Now I'm going to go back in that same hole. And what you're going to see that I'm doing is I'm sort of building up a foundation. I keep going back and forth until I feel as if I've built up a, enough of yarn so it resembles the rest of the cast on. And I'm not pulling very tight. The cast on isn't very tight. That is, I'm not going to pull tight yet. I'm going to keep on going until I feel as if I have enough of a buildup of yarn and it resembles. It's coming even with my cast on. Now that I feel as if I have enough, I'm going to go back into that same hole on this side and I'm going to first grab one stitch in. Now I'm going to go to the other side, back in that same space, grab one stitch up. And now I'm going to grab two bars on one side and two bars on the other. Always return your needle back to the same hole that you were up in once before and I'm going to grab two bars. There's two bars on this side. These are the purl stitches. Two bars on that side. Now you notice I haven't pulled tight this whole time. Now I'm ready to pull tight, but before I do, I'm going to run my needle across the bottom edge and I want to pick up the X of that foundation that I tried to build up. I want to try to make the edge very even. Now that I've done that, now I'm going to pull. And you're going to see now how two bars on one side, go back into the same space, two bars on the other, Notice I'm pinching this and pulling, and you'll see that this is beginning to look like one continuous piece. Go back into the same hole you were in once before. This yarn comes out of this spot here. I'm going to go back into that same space and come up two bars. Now, because you have the same amount of rows on either side, you won't need pins because you're matching row with row. I'm pinching it and pulling. And with the ribbing, we've been following a purl stitch all the way up. Now that we're going to go into stockinette stitch, see how this matches perfectly? Now that we're going to go into stockinette stitch, I want to grab now one stitch in. Two bars up, but one stitch in. One bar two bars. Notice I'm working on the right side. Go back into the same space and come up one, two. In books you'll see this done where they've come up one bar on one side and one bar on the other. And I'm sure that's going to work but it's a lot of work and your seams do not have to survive the sweater. So it's to come up two bars on one side and two bars on the other is sufficient. Now you're going to see how we won't see any seam at all. And you don't pull very tight. Pull until the yarn stops. Every now and then, just to make sure not, you're not pulling too tight, you want to pull it lengthwise. As you're going up the side of a sweater, you may notice that one side is longer than the other. Maybe by accident you've grabbed 
three bars on one side or you've just maybe you have knitted more on one side than the, than the other you can correct this if you're noticing that you're uneven you can actually do three bars on one side and two bars on the other until you've made both sides even There is no seam visible on, on the right side. On the wrong side, there will be a seam, but that's okay. I think it's important that the outside should be invisible. Now this looks like a continuous piece of ribbing. And our little stitch here, where we joined it, really looks like a purl stitch. And it's very even along the bottom edge. The mattress stitch does make an invisible seam on the right side of the garment, but it, it does show a seam on the inside. Here's a way of joining seams for an afghan so both sides look finished. Here's how it's done. This is an example of an afghan. Two pieces of knitting, and we want to join them. If the mattress stitch makes a seam on the inside, try dropping the end stitch. And what will result will be loops on the sides. Notice I didn't bind off my end. With a crochet hook, I'm going to take two or three stitches on one side and bring them through two or three loops, I should say, on the other. Three through three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Depending on your stitch gauge, you have to experiment with how many stitches to pick up. You see what's happening? We're getting a nice braid which will look good on both sides. Now you have a lacy seam to your afghan pieces that is attractive on both sides. To install a set-in sleeve resembles that of sewing pattern methods. The side seam and the sleeve seam will be sewn with the mattress stitch. Remember the mattress stitch, we're using the tail of the cast on, and we need to first build up our found foundation. We're going to go back and forth and back and forth, making the very bottom resemble the cast on. And as soon as you feel that's enough of a foundation, then begin to go up one bar on one side, one bar, one bar on the other. And then two bars and two bars. Now I'm ready to take this sleeve and pin it to the body of the sweater. Just like in sewing patterns, you're going to use right sides together. Let's do it on this one, it's already done. And we'll be matching the bottom the seam of the side seam to the seam of the sleeve seam. We're going to be using a lot of pins. The 
This is the bottom sleeve seam, and we're going to go all the way up to the very top of the sleeve. To find that, you can fold it, and this top of the sleeve will go right to where we did the Kitchener stitch. Here's the string that tells us where we ended. So that gets matched up there. When you're pinning the sleeve to the armhole, you want to have the sleeve, you want to have the body facing you, and the sleeve should be placed slightly higher than the armhole itself. See, there's my, my sleeve seam, here's my body seam, and the sleeve seam is just slightly higher. In order to install the sleeve, we're going to be using the back stitch. The back stitch is a very strong seam. So when you move your arm, it'll withstand all the stretching. Now we're going to be sewing two layers together. And in order to sew the two layers together, but to make sure that we're getting both layers, that's why I want the one edge to be slightly higher. That way we'll make sure we're catching both edges. Now we're ready to do the back stitch. I'm trying to use any strings that I have, any tails that I have left still available. With the back stitch, I'm going to be on the, with the body side facing me. I'm going to come down, and then I'm going to come back up again. Almost like a running stitch. And then I'm going to pull very firmly. Now I'm going to go back one space, and I'm going to go forward one space. So the yarn that's coming out of the knitting, this is my previous stitch and I'm going to pull. Here's my previous stitch again. I'm going to go back in that space and come under my yarn sticking up. Go back into that same hole again and come under. With my seam of the sleeve slightly higher, I'm going to make sure I have all of that seam. This is the same back stitch that they use in embroidery. This is one seam that should be pulled firmly. Most of this armhole is straight knitting, and I want to make sure I'm one stitch in on the body side. That's why I always want the body facing me. I can see where to put my needle through. Since there has to be an underside, by having the edge slightly higher, it assures me that I'm catching all of the seam of the sleeve. I'm running out of yarn here, so I might have to add another yarn. I ran out of yarn here, so I'm going to start a new string. I've threaded the needle with a new yarn. And I'm just going to leave this tail because later I'm going to show you how to weave in the ends. I'm just going to pretend I still have yarn. I'm not going to knot it. I'm going to pull just until I have a string to work with later.
remove the pins. And you have a set in seam where all the seam has been caught. Oh, there's one more pin. This is nice and straight until you get into where the decreased area was. Most sleeve patterns begin at the bottom cuff, increasing to a certain amount of stitches at the top. Sewing the flat, bound off drop shoulder sleeve to the side of the body is very difficult. An easy way to improve this joining is to pick up the side of the back and front and knit the drop shoulder sleeve down to the cuff. Look at the two markers that you left, indicating where the sleeve is going to be installed. At that point, instead of casting on a certain amount of stitches and working up to the amount of stitches you should have for the top of the sleeve, you're going to begin with the amount of stitches you have for the top of the sleeve. For example, let's say I'm supposed to end with 100 stitches at the top of this sleeve. If I were doing it from the cuff up, now I'm going to begin and start knitting down to the cuff. Pick up and knit the side of your sweater between the armhole markers. Here's the two armhole markers. And just like you're going you're to pick up stitches for the neck edge, you're going to pick up along the edge of your the front and back on the side. You're one whole stitch in on the right side and you can pick up however amount of stitches you need for the top of the sleeve. If you have a hundred stitches, then you want to, might want to split it up where here's the here's one armhole, here's the other armhole markers, here's my shoulder seam, I pick up 50 here and 50 there and you want to space it so you are picking up an even amount. You won't grab every single hole, you'll be skipping some and just distributing the stitches you're picking up evenly. And this way your sleeve will be attached to the side of your sweater from the start. And you'll knit this sleeve down to the cuff, decreasing every so many rows. As opposed to when you're knitting the sleeve from the cuff up, you have to increase. You'll be decreasing down to the cuff. You might even have to reverse your pattern directions if you're supposed to increase evenly across the row when you're starting the sleeve, starting the cuff, you'll have to decrease evenly across the row when you're doing the cuff. And then once you're finished doing this sleeve, you're going to bind off in pattern at the cuff. But let me show you how it's done on a knitting machine. Machine knitters can pick up and knit this way. Bring the amount of needles out that you need for the top of the sleeve. I need 56 stitches altogether for the top of this sleeve, so that's 28 on either side. And I'm going to rehang this edge between the two markers onto these needles. First thing I'm going to do is take my transfer tool and where this left marker is, I'm going to hang this on the leftmost stitch. Where this right marker is, I'm going to hang this on the rightmost stitch. Where, my, where I Kishner stitch my shoulder, which is right here, I'll put that on the center of the knitting machine. Now I have these two areas. I'm going to find the center of this area and hang it there. And then I'm going to hang centers of centers. And I'm going to fill this in. I might have four holes here, but I have three needles. So that means I'm going to be skipping a hole here and there, and that's okay. I need to fit this space between my markers on a specific amount of needles, the amount of needles or stitches that I need for the top of the sleeve. So I'm now rehanging the edge of my sweater, one stitch in, just like I did for the neck, finding the centers of this little droop here. Here's two holes but I'm going to choose this one to go in this single needle. So there will be many holes that don't have uh, stitch needles going in them. Here's my second section where I'm going to find the center and it goes on this needle
you're one whole stitch in. This is a straight edge, and it's very simple to see what is one whole stitch. When we were doing the neck edge, sometimes there was a question as to what well, was one whole stitch, but this is very easy to do. You can just see a whole line of holes indicating where one stitch is and where the next stitch is. Again, I'm first finding the centers of an area that's not onto the needles, and then I'm going to fit everything onto the amount of needles I have. So I'm doing this sleeve from the top down, so the, then I'm going to fo be following the pattern in a reverse manner push everything back behind the latches and because this edge could be somewhat thick I'm going to close these latches just in case this latch comes back and begins to cut right into my edge even though the magnets inside the machine take care of latches sometimes they're straight back and it's too late and it's caught into the edge of the sweater I'm pushing the sweater between the knitter and the ribber I'm going to set my row counter for zero, but I want to come across one row. I want this to be a little bit tighter. It's almost like when you sew the sleeve to the body, you want the seam to be pretty firm. So I'm going to be a few numbers lower. I'm going to be on number six. And before I come across, I'm going to close all these latches just in case this edge could be kind of thick and when my needle slides back, I don't want it to catch into the edge of my, my sweater. So I'll close the latches just to be sure. I'm going to come across that one row. I'm going to reset my tension back up to whatever I did my sleep, my, the body on, put my row counter to zero, and follow the pattern from the top down. That means I'm to decrease every fourth row, one stitch on either side. I first should knit five rows plain. This is just a sample pattern. And I'm going to decrease by using the full fashion method of decreasing. That means I'm going to take two stitches or three stitches on one side and move it in one space. When you do a full fashion method of decreasing, the edge stitch is always straight. So when you're doing the mattress stitch, you'll know exactly where to put your needle into it. I've finished making the sleeve, two more rows left, and now I'm ready to go into the cuff. Now I have an even amount of stitches, I want to make it an odd amount, I'm going to decrease only on one side. I have an odd amount so I can have a knit stitch on either side. I do that so I can sew up a side seam and it can look nice when you have a knit stitch on both ends. I'm going to take my knitter arm off, put on my ribber arm to prepare to do ribbing for the cuff of the sleeve. Before I begin, because I'm going from stocking the stitch to ribbing, I need to add these ribber weights, just as we did for the neck. This time I only need two. Now I'm going to transfer every other stitch down to the ribber. Okay, I'm ready to do the ribbing. I'm going to turn it down to whatever tension I did the ribbing on the other part of the uh, sweater. I'm going to set my row counter to zero. And my particular pattern does 28 rows of ribbing. Now hand knitters can easily bind off in pattern when ending with knit one purl and ribbing. But on a knitting machine we're going to have to take it off on waste yarn and I need to separate the knits from the purls. So I'm going to cut this yarn about double the length of what's on there now. This is the yarn I'm going to be sewing this bind off up with. 
and I'm going to put the waste yarn in. So usually with waste yarn, you should just come across and start knitting, but I need to separate the knits from the purls. In order to do that, I'm going to press in my part buttons, the opposite part buttons, causing one direction to knit, and when I go the other direction, one direction the knitter will knit, the other direction the ribber will knit. This is referred to in the manual as circular knitting. I'm going to increase the stitch size so this waist yarn will be larger. And when I go one direction, the knitter knits. When I go the other direction, the ribber knits. Knitter, ribber. For every two passes, that means I've, I've knitted all the knits and now all the purls. And you can see that my, I'm making a circle. And when I take this off, this stitch is called the happy sad stitch because of the way the needle enters the stitches. The name helps you to remember which way to insert the needle into the stitch. When you are on the upper row of stitches, your needle will make a happy face. When you're on the lower row of stitches, your needle will make a sad face. Just remember that when you are up, you're happy, and when you're sad, you're down. Start by taking the yarn coming out of the needle and finding the last stitch. And You want to insert your needle from the outside through that last stitch, bringing your needle up to the inside of the circle. Again, you're going to go back into that same stitch and you're going to reach for the first stitch on the back. Remember this by you always want to be happy before you want to be sad, so you're going to go to the upper side first and you're going to make sort of a happy face. Again, you're going to take that stitch you were in once before and you're going to make a sad face. You're on the lower. When I say a sad face, your needle goes like this, as if it is making a sad face. You're going to catch these two yarns. Now you're up, so you're going to make a happy face. That means you're going to go into the stitch you were in once before and into the next stitch. Because hand knitters can bind off in pattern, Machine knitters have to do it a little bit differently. So this is worth the extra time to make a very nice edge. Again, you don't want to pull too tight. Because this is, should be as elastic as the ribbing. Another way of remembering how to do this is follow the waist yarn. You see this pink waist yarn going under this stitch here, the stitch we were once before, in once before, and out this stitch. So this is a sad face. And a happy face. This stitch can be used any time you end with ribbing. If you're making a boat neck sweater, you start off with stockinette stitch and end with ribbing at the top. You'll remove the stitches, the ribbing stitches, on waist yarn circularly and finish them off this way. Now I'm at the last stitch. I make sure all stitches are caught. Maybe go into the single stitch. Now let's remove the waist yarn. The waist yarn will come off in a circle. There it is. I think I'll give this a cut. Gone. Now this sleeve is finished off perfectly and you're ready to do the mattress stitch.
Now we're going to talk about graphing ribbing at shoulders for boat neck sweaters. When two rib shoulders are sewn together by backstitching, it could create a very bulky seam. Improve your seams by grafting these rib stitches and seams will be much neater, less bulky, and the knits and pearls will appear to match. Finish the ribbed edge by hand, either by binding off in pattern for hand knitters or doing the happy sad stitch for machine knitters. The boat neck should have an opening of about 8 to 10 inches. You want to start from the right side, and I have my yarn coming from one side, and I'm going to look only for the knit stitches. I'm going to grab two, well, the first I'm going to grab a half of a stitch on, on one side, just like the Kitchener stitch. Now I'm only going to look for the knit stitches, and I'm going to grab, this is one knit stitch here, this is another knit stitch here. This little ditch right here, that's a purl stitch. I'm going to grab half of one stitch, half of that one knit stitch, and half of the next knit stitch. Now I'm going to go to the other side. Here's half of one knit stitch, half of the next stitch, the next knit stitch only. Okay, I'm going to keep pulling so I can tell what are knit stitches. I'm going to go back into the same knit stitch I was in once before, and I'm going to grab half of this stitch and half of the next knit stitch. Half of this knit stitch and half of the next one. I'm completely ignoring the purl stitches. I'm going to come back and take care of them later. Half and half. Again, this is half of this knit stitch, which is here, and half of that knit stitch. So I'm going to grab this half and that half. Pull only so the stitching looks like the rest of the knitting. Half and half. I'm going to keep working until I feel as if I have enough of the shoulder sewn. And then I'm going to stop and I'm going to do the other side. Let's say I stop here and I'm going to go do the other side. And then I'm going to try this on. Let's say I've done this other side and I'm going to put this over my head to make sure it fits right. Once I'm happy with however many stitches I've done on either side, and I might want to count the stitches, then I'm going to turn this over. And remember when I was always doing the knit stitches on the underside, what was a purl stitch on the other side is now a knit stitch on this side. And now I can finish this off by doing the knit stitches on this side. When you're doing this stitch, you're only seeing knits. So one way you're doing the upper side, and you're only catching really half of the stitches, only the knit stitches, and then you turn this over and you go find the knit stitches, which were the purl stitches on the right side, on this side. And when I turn this over, it looks like the knits are matching the knits and the pearls are matching the pearls. This is flat on both sides. Let's talk about zipper installations. The edge of the two front pieces must be prepared and a finished edge will make the zipper front look neater and will be easier to install. Single crochet the two front edges, then backwards single crochet that same edge. The backwards single crochet creates a rolled edge effect. Let me show you how it's done. I'm just going to use this as a sample. This is the side of our afghan. And this crochet, you would pick the appropriate size crochet hook. And 
and you'd single crochet down the edge of the front. Depending on your yarn and the size of the single of the crochet hook, you might skip a hole every now and then, or you might find that if you go through every hole, that works out fine. You should look to see that your crocheting is, is flat. If it looks too large, then skip a hole every now and then. If it looks too small, then you might need a larger crochet hook. So I'm single crocheting, I'm inserting the crochet hook through, yarn over and bringing it through, then I'm yarning over and bringing through two. So here is my single crocheted edge. Now I'm going to do the backward single crochet, and that's just like a crochet, a single crochet, except I'm going to be moving from the left to the right. And this makes a nice rolled edge. Now I'm going to reach in the back, grab the yarn, and bring it through, and then through two. And again, I'm going to go to the next stitch, moving backwards. This is also called the crab stitch. And someone else just told me it's called the shrimp stitch. See now that's creating a nice rolled edge. And because of the fact that it's creating this new texture on the edge, this line that's created is a perfect place for you to stitch with your sewing machine the zipper into place. Inserting it right into this little piece right back here. Insert into the stitch. Come get the yarn, bring it through, yarn over, bring through two. Insert it into the next stitch, get the yarn from the back, bring it through, yarn over, and bring it through two. Insert it through that stitch, bring it through, and through two. And there's a nice rolled edge. So if you look at these sweaters here, there's my backward single crochet, and there is my single crochet, the regular single crochet. And when I sewed my zipper in, and I'll, I'm going to show you with contrasting thread, I first basted the zipper in place. Notice how the edge of my rolled edge is right on the teeth. And with my sewing machine and a zipper foot, I was able to come down with the sewing machine right between the single crochet and the rolled edge or the backward single crochet. Another idea is to first finish off one edge with the single crochet and backward single crochet. And then you want to pick up along the entire edge of the other side and knit about an inch of ribbing. And this will conceal the zipper altogether. Here's a little hint for improving the edges of bands, collars, and tabs. Ribbing is a fabric that does not curl. That may be the reason we finish our sweaters with bands and collars that are ribbed, as this rib section prevents the curling of the stockinette stitched areas. Many times ribbing is used for decorative accents such as pockets or shoulder, epaulets or tabs. Look at this piece of ribbed fabric. One side is bumpy. The other side is smooth. The smooth side is more desirable. It is done by having two knit stitches together, making a small amount of stockinette stitch, which will roll the edge. When making a vertical band for a buttonho buttonhole band for a cardigan, have the two end stitches be knit stitches. This band is knit one, purl one, but the last two stitches are two knit stitches together. The pattern might read knit, knit, purl, knit, purl, knit, knit. The two knit stitches on the end create a little bit of stockinette stitch. Stockinette stitch always wants to curl. This will cause the edge of the ribbing to roll slightly, creating a smoother edge. 
A seed stitch epaulette is greatly improved with an extra knit stitch on either side. Try this little trick on your next project. Now let's talk about making your own puff shoulder pads and installing them. Knitting is generally a heavy fabric, and it's hardly ever described as crisp, which would make a nice puff. A puff sleeve may not look so puffed unless you give it a little help. With remaining yarn, knit two pieces of knitting about 4x4. Four four. Fold this knitted square in half and fill with strands of leftover yarn. And you can take this and put it into the seam of the sleeve, just like that. So here's my little square filled with leftover yarn, and I'm going to stitch it right into the sleeve. And now it's going to live on the inside of the sleeve cap. When I wear this sweater, I'll have the, the puff filled out. Now let's talk about how to shorten or lengthen your knits. Too many sweaters are stashed away simply because they seem to be the wrong length. You will see that changing the length is very easy and can be done with the help of a scissors and a knitting needle. If your sweater is sewn together, you must first undo the seam. Find the thread or yarn that was used for sewing the side seam, but be careful. The wrong cut could create a hole. When you are sure you have found the stitching yarn, cut it and unravel the sewing thread in the seam slightly above where you wish to shorten or lengthen. With a pointed scissors, cut the end yarn. Let's say you want to shorten it right to here. I'm going to cut the end yarn, and you're going to see how easy it is to pick out the stitch. Pick this right out. You really don't have to worry about the stitches unraveling, especially if it's a sweater that's been around for a while. Most likely those stitches are set. Now when that string gets longer and longer, just give it a cut and keep going all the way across. Now this piece that I'm taking off the bottom, I can unravel from the top down and I can use this to finish off this main piece. Except when you get to the end, you might want to keep that yarn a little bit longer so you can weave it in later. You need some length to weave it in. You can catch these stitches on your knitting needle. And you can easily knit the ribbing down to the bottom and bind off in pattern. And that would be if you're shortening it. If you're lengthening it, you could knit some and then end the knitting the way you want to. Now your stitches are ready to be knitted. The commercial neck band is a method for machine knitters when the shaping of a neck on the machine would not be convenient. This would include any type of knitting, but especially when shaping the neck might complicate the production of an already complicated fabric, such as double jacquard knitting, ribbing designs, or garter carriage patterns. This application of the neck ribbing, which is made separately, sandwiches the neck edge of your sweater and gives your neck ribbing a very professional look. 
The back and front of this sweater has been made. The two pieces are identical. There is no neck shaping that I produced on the machine. Now what I'm about to do is I'm going to take this piece here and I'm going to baste the semicircle of the neck edge with some thread or some yarn. Now what I've done is I've basted the shape of the semicircle of a round neck with slightly contrasting thread just so you can see what I'm doing. But if you do it in, in a real sweater, you really should do it in thread that matches identically, just in case it shows through when you're all done. So what's going to happen next is we're about to take this basted circle and I'm going to stitch with my sewing machine over the basting. So you really should use thread of the same color as the sweater because you will be stitching this in. After basting, take your sewing machine and zigzag over the basting. Then straight stitch over your zigzag. Now you're going to take your scissors and just cut on the outside of your zigzag and straight stitch. The next step is to join the shoulders. You can join the shoulders with the Kitchener stitch or join on the machine. Here's our cut edge and now we have to make a piece of ribbing. To determine how many ribbing stitches we're going to need, we're going to hold the entire neck edge up to the knitting machine. One easy way of doing this is to fold this in half, pull taunt to find the center of the entire neck edge. And I can hold that center up to where the center of the machine is and approximate how many needles I'm going to need for ribbing. Knit approximately three quarters the total length of your neckband. On this sample, I've knitted approximately five rows. On the next row, increase your tension by two full numbers. On the last row, bring your tension back to the number you did the rest of the ribbing on. With the stitches from the loose row, or the head of the previous stitch, transfer the knitter stitches to the ribber. Now transfer all the ribber stitches, the stitches previous to the ones that are on the hook, back up to the empty knitter needles. That means all needles will be filled. Circularly knit in garment yarn for approximately a half an inch. Refer to your ribber manual to see how to circularly knit. Now you're ready to cut the garment yarn, but leave, leave a long enough tail to be able to bind off this edge later. Circularly knit approximately an inch of waist yarn. Remember that when you knit in a circle, one way the knitter knits and one way the ribber knits. So it would take you 14 passes of the carriage to make seven rows of knitting. The waist yarn has been cut and there's no yarn in the carriage. To remove the neckband from the machine, come across one row. Here's what the band is going to look like when you remove it from the machine. Notice the circular waist yarn. Notice also these small stitches that we're going to rehang back onto the machine, enclosing the neck edge. Now hang the entire neck edge back onto the same needles where the ribbing was made.
push the stitches back behind the latches and the edge that was cut and sewn. Now we're going to take the band and we have stitches on an, we have an upper level of stitches and a lower level, level of stitches. Take these waist yarn stitches and hang them in the hooks. So take the upper level of waist yarn stitches first. Close the latches so the latches don't cut into your edge and bring the needles back then bring the stitches through the edge. Bring the needles forward again and now take these stitches held on waist yarn on the lower section and hang these stitches onto the hooks. Now bring these stitches again through the stitches behind the latches. After pulling all your stitches through, begin to bind off loosely across the entire neck edge. After binding off all your neck stitches, sew the remaining shoulder together same as you did the first shoulder. Stitch the little neck seam with the mattress stitch. And this is what it should look like. Now let's talk about weaving in ends and how to avoid knots. A nicely knitted sweater that looks good on the outside is considered well made when it looks neat on the inside. The knot in the middle of a row should be avoided. The knot on the side seam cut leaving two tails like TV antennas is no way to end hours of hard work. A ribbon at the fair would also be too much to hope for as any judge looks for knots first. Here's how to avoid that messy wrong side look. First, when you are knitting your sweater and your ball of yarn remaining is not enough to make another row, Start another ball of yarn before you are into the row. This leaves all old and new ends on the side. A knot in the middle of a sweater could leave a dimple on the right side of the knitting and this would be unattractive. When you are finished your sweater, there will be many tails in the side of the garment. Instead of making knots, thread the end of the tail and follow the trail of a stitch. Here's how it's done. You could run down the line of a seam. That's one way to do it. And then just cut it. Probably make it about an inch or two. Or to follow the trail of a stitch, you want to pick out a stitch. And I'm going to now place my yarn following the stitch on the back. The stitch I'm following is going in and out. That yarn is going in this stitch and under these stitches and I'm really placing this tail of a yarn on, on the back behind a stitch. You won't see anything on the front and you really won't see anything on the inside either. That's why this is the neatest way to get rid of all your ends. As soon as you feel as if you've done about an inch worth of weaving, you want to stretch it just in case you stretch your sweater when you wear it. You don't want these to pop out. And then cut it right to the knitting. Be careful not to cut the actual sweater itself. And then the end is gone. 
A final steaming might be necessary to smooth any imperfections. The set-in sleeve seam may be steamed by stuffing a rolled towel or a sewer's hem inside for added shape. Let it sit not only to cool but to dry. Excess shrinking of ribbing causing some puckering just under the neck can be corrected by steaming and slightly stretching the neck ribbing. Your sweater is knitted, put together to perfection, and ready to keep you or someone you love warm and looking good. I hope you've enjoyed learning some new ways of finishing your future heirlooms. Thank you. Whether you're a hand or a machine knitter, here's a great idea for planning your next sweater. Introducing Design a Sweater, an erasable knitter's grid. Choose from two versions for machine knitters. Version one is for those using mylar sheets. Enjoy tracing your small or very large designs easily by placing your blank mylar sheet over your drawing. Version two is for those using punch cards. Here's a space for you to work at designs. Transfer to your blank punch card by placing the card over your design. Hand knitters might prefer this one. Using our models, it's easy to draw over the simple body shapes and plan and think about the proportion and the design of your dreams. Turn your design and sweater over and you will find a space for your schematic. This is a simple illustration of your sweater shape and its measurements. Record your stitch and row information here for easy reference. Now multiply your stitch and row information times your measurement and map out each stitch on this easy to see knitter's grid. Here's a simple example. At five stitches per inch, my sweater is 20 inches wide. 5 times 20 is 100. This means I need 100 stitches for the width of the sweater back. To illustrate this on design a sweater, place a line under 50 squares to the left and 50 squares to the right of center. We recommend using only overhead projector felt tip pens for the design outline. They dry fast and are easy to wipe away. Now look at the length from above the bottom ribbing to the armhole. It's 11 inches. I have 7 rows to the inch. 11 times 7 is 77. Place a line on each side of the bottom line to row 77. There are easy reference charts that will help you to plan your armhole lens and the width of the back of the necks for any style sweater. Once your design is on the board, have fun creating your own designs. Using special water-soluble crayons, matching the crayon to your yarn, play with color to your heart's content. These beautiful artist quality crayons come in their own sturdy tin. They are long lasting and come in three sizes. Make a mistake or not sure of your idea? With a wet cloth, simply wipe away the marker, the crayons, and try again. Design a sweater is easy to use as it allows you to see and experiment with your ideas before they become sweaters. Design a sweater is $29.95 plus $3.95 shipping. Please specify which version you prefer. The crayons come in three sizes, 30 crayons for $24.95, 40 crayons for $34.95, 84 crayons for $79.95. This box includes metallics. Overhead projector pens are available for $1.29. Add $3.95 for shipping. Crayons can be used for knit leader mylar sheets. Enjoy getting professional results with Blockers, a stainless steel blocking wire kit that helps you to shape and improve the look of your knitted pieces. Each kit comes with eight 36-inch stiff wires for straight seamed areas, 
four 18 inch stiff wires for tension swatches, smaller sweaters or afghan squares, and two flexible wires used to properly shape sleeve caps and armholes. Complete instructions are included with each package. T-pins are available for $2. To order blockers, please send $14.50 plus $3.50 shipping to Fiber Fancy, 6 Hunter's Horn Court, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117, or call 1-800-242-NIT. Major credit cards are accepted.